and welcome to another episode of AP Taylor Swift, the podcast for Swifties who like to dive a layer deeper into the music. So lean in close, turn up your volume because class is in session. We're your hosts. I'm Monsi. I'm Jen. And I'm Jody. And we are your unofficial professors of Taylor Swift. All right, welcome back to AP Taylor Swift. We have another exciting episode for you today. But before we get started, want to remind you to rate and review us uh, and follow us on your favorite podcast app. You can also follow us on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube at AP Taylor Swift to get a little behind the scenes of this podcast and some fun social content. You can also interact and engage with us. We do respond. I have fun with it. All right. So today's topic is cities. Spoiler? Specifically cities. Specifically cities. Yes. I, so, so spoiler alert, I did, we're not doing suburban legends because <laughs> we're talking urban, not suburban. The other spoiler alert thing we're not talking about. So we pre-record. And this episode is being recorded before the Tortured Poets Department actually comes out. So unfortunately, that means we couldn't cover So Long London. But I guess that just means we'll do a Cities Part 2 at some point. There is definitely other city references, too. Taylor loves to drop names of places. So we definitely won't cover all of them. But we had a very specific discussion of, is this going to be a places episode or a like <laughs> cities? And we were doing major metropolitan cities specifically, which means yeah. you can probably guess right now which, what our right, which ones we're going to do. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We went very yeah. straightforward with this one. And I think one of the cool things about doing specific cities is that in literature and in books, cities are often a character in themselves. So if you have a novel sometimes you have all the individual characters if charles dickens would dickens would do this with london for example like that was a character in and of itself so i'm i'm pretty excited because i think there's so many directions we can go with this do we dive in then we'll just get started yeah, go all right go for it cool all right well i have the first city and Mine is from the year 2014, so if anyone can guess, like, <laughs> the obvious place to start, it's Welcome <laughs> to New York. It was on 1989. We just got Taylor's version in 2023, written by Taylor Swift and Ryan B. Tedder originally. Ooh, not a solo Taylor song for you. Not a solo Taylor song, and I thought it was funny that there's a co-writer on this because it's, like, a pretty simple song lyrically, I think, but... Maybe that's like part of the genius. We're going to unpack it. So it's, it's, we'll unpack it. it's all we'll good. We'll get there. <laughs> I feel like Welcome to New York is a really polarizing song because people either love it or hate it. It's definitely repetitive. They You say the words, Welcome to New York, a lot. I actually tried to count and it was 29 times. Oh my God. Throughout That is song. like a very New Yorker thing. Actually, I was going to say, is it a very New Yorker thing to do to be like, we talk a lot about New York all the time, but then also we're not the most welcoming. So maybe we wouldn't say it 29 times. Well, I think that's <laughs> the thing that's so interesting is I actually tried to see if I could find any origins of this phrase, welcome to New York. Obviously it's on the signs when you enter the state. And I couldn't find any specifics around the phrase itself, but I do think it's interesting that she repeats it because – I think it has a lot to do with New York's history in general, which is that New York is one of those places which has been a global cap capital in the world for centuries. And often you are welcoming, or like often the state and the city has been welcoming people from all walks of life and all over the world. So whether the people themselves are welcoming or not, it's certainly a place that has welcomed many, many, many people over the years. Yeah, it's the, it was the entry point to the U.S. for a very long time and still yeah. in a lot of ways is. And yeah. entry point's a good phrasing here because this is also track one on 1989, which is her entry into pop. And so I don't remember what episode it was on, but I think we talked about this song in theory or maybe it was just what it did within the, the album 1989. But we didn't get into the specifics that it needed to introduce her audience to her pop era. Yeah, I think we talked about it in our Shake It Off deep dive. Uh, that yes. was the first 
single to be released. Correct. And it does have the lyric, it's a new soundtrack. I could dance to this beat, beat forevermore. So mm-hmm. very, she's not yeah. shy about what she's doing. And it was also a pivotal time in her lives. We've talked about that too, where she was moving to New York herself. So she herself was kind of going on this journey that many artists before have gone on. I think in American pop culture, we hear about two big cities a lot when artists are concerned, which is like New York and LA. It's like Mm -hmm. making that big life change and move. I actually, so we talked a little bit about Entry Point with Ellis Island, but one thing that I was interesting to me was even before Ellis Island was established, basically since the foundation of America as a nation, New York was always the entry point of emigration. And I think that is important because the difference between immigration and emigration is immigration, you just go live in a different country. Emigrate is you are leaving behind your country to go somewhere new, which just comes with a lot more baggage and a lot more weight, I think, because nobody just ups and leaves forever. Um, And the circumstances in which a lot of people came through the gates of New York and came there, it was this really heavy getting away from religious persecution or getting away from poverty or getting away from harder conditions in hope of something better. And so the associations that you just have with the city to, to many degrees to this day is, is you have people who start from the ground up, they're building something from scratch. You have this idea of you have to work for whatever you get and you have to earn it. There's a lot of poverty at times because people will come penniless and you have to like really kind of hustle you're surrounded by you diversity start over. of people. And you have to start over. And a lot of these themes actually in the lyrics, as simple as they are, yes. they are kind of sprinkled throughout this song, which is pretty cool. Starting over to me came out the most when we first dropped our bags on apartment floors, took our broken hearts, put them in a drawer. Everybody here was someone else before. So it just it she's directly calling out that there's the end of who you used to be, whether that is, you know, because you were heartbroken and had to start over or just you moved here to be somebody new. The There's like a parallel structure in like those, that line, that stanza and the first stanza. And mm-hmm. I also, I love that everybody here was someone else before. I also love that everyone, everybody here wanted something more. Yes. Two really simple statements, but really, really powerful statements. And I think when it comes to New York, it's like absolutely true, right? I think, too, I really love the personification of New York. I think we'll sort of get this in all of our songs and kind of to what, Monzi, you were saying at the beginning, that cities can be characters themselves. But we get that the idea of that New York, it's been waiting for you. That's such an interesting personification of, like, the city has been waiting. The city has enough knowledge and enough sentience to be waiting for you. And also, what an incredible statement that something as big as important has been waiting for you specifically is a very I don't know it's it's I always love that line because it's also like the way it's happening you it it feels so special but then they also she talks about the lights the lights are so bright but they never blind me but my the literary reference I wanted to bring up with this is this reminds me in a lot of ways of my favorite Langston Hughes poem which is very short so I'm going to read it for you Uh, Langston Hughes has a lot of poetry that's really cool but I always love this one it's very simply just called the city in the morning the city spreads its wings making a song and stone that sings in the evening the city goes to bed hanging lights above its head very short very simple but it captures that's New York yeah except it doesn't go to bed it but it (laughs) captures it captures a lot of the beauty of cities it's sort of that personification I actually taught this poem and I had some students point out the idea of hanging lights above its head is a very like parental thing to do and that the people who are hanging the lights are the residents of the city, that they are taking care of their city. They're hanging the lights above its head Mm -hmm. at night. And I just thought that was like a really beautiful imagery and also was like a 17 year old that pointed that out. And I was like, yeah. The kids are going far, kid. You'll go far, kid. (laughs) I love that you brought up Langston Hughes because I haven't looked up whether Langston Hughes moved to New York, but I assume he did at the time of jazz era at some point, like lived in New York and was a big part of the musical scene. The Harlem Renaissance stuff. For the Harlem Renaissance. Exactly. Yeah. But I, I think she actually has sprinkled through like other also prominent people who maybe again were someone else before and then moved to New York. And one example is, Jody, you brought up the lyric of forevermore. And that to me immediately 
reminds me of Edgar Allan Poe course, and The Raven yeah. uh, forevermore. And Edgar Allan Poe was another one of those authors who originally from Boston ended up moving to New York and lived in the Bronx for a while. So it's, it's interesting that she has these kind of like artsy references maybe to other legends. Which is very that like many people, many artists, authors – Art moved to New York to, as you said, it was New York and, and LA or where you would have that cultural shift or where the center of arts and entertainment. But I want to go back to, because Jen, you were talking about the lights, the way she uses the senses, I think is one of those ways that she both captures the beauty of New York, but also personifies the city. So you have, you know, the village is a glow kaleidoscope of heart, loud heartbeats under coats. The sound we hadn't heard before, it's a new soundtrack. I can dance to this beat. So she's really making the city come alive through the senses and capturing this feeling that is very energetic and electric. And that is exactly what I think to me captures New York. And so I think she did it in a really beautiful way. And I have my first enchanted reference of the day. Oh, that uh, was early. <laughs> this is this is good. This is early. All right. It's actually, it's actually the first line, the walking through a crowd, the village is a glow. To me, mm. that line, like I do not think of New York as a village. It is the city of all okay. cities. But pause. She's calling the village. She said the village. Yes. Yes. Greenwich no, village, I agree. Or the West Village or the well, East Village. One but it's not it's not capitalized. So one thing to point out there is, yes, there are actually parts of the city that have village in the name. But I also think that by leaving it lowercase, you can like almost reference that. But you can also talk about like village. The old word of village actually does mean city. Uh, it's mm. an old term. And so by saying the village is a glow, like you're saying the surrounding city is a glow, but you're using a little bit of an older term for it that is in the name of some cities. She's just not, I, I think if she wanted to reference the village, she could have capitalized it, you know? Oh, I, I guess because it's a song and I only print out the lyrics for these purposes, it never occurred to me that it would be would be any place other than Greenwich Village because you just call it the, like, I never say I'm going to Greenwich Village. I say I'm going well, to Well, I also village. think it can like have a play on mer- words and be like people, right? You can say the village is also people. Like New York is one of the most populated cities in this country. And you can say like, people are a glow. Of course, the city itself is a glow because it's it's a city of lights. And she's, yeah, the only way you know that it's a crowd, it's people, as you says, a yep. crowd. But I love the way she calls it kaleidoscope of loud heartbeats under coats. She's not saying it's a crowd of people, but you understand that she's surrounded by people because it's the heartbeats under, the kaleidoscope of heartbeats under coats. It was beautiful. Poetic. Wait, so where's the enchanted reference? So the enchanted <laughs> reference is, okay, so fairy tales. Walk with me uh, for a second. But okay. I, I got this image of Belle singing through the village in Beauty and the Beast, that opening I song. I love it. Yes. You know, yes. it's it's her intro <laughs> to the city. And Bonjour. Good day. Yeah. And I just imagine her billowing coat just typesing through the city and and talking about how the village is a glow. I, I know this is not a deep dive, but I also really like the coats specifically because that's also very New York. When you think of the other big places in a musician's life, you might have L.A., you might have Nashville. But if you say coats, if you say you're around a lot of people, like in a massive crowd when people are wearing coats, I'm thinking New York, maybe Chicago. Like there's yes. not that many. It's very, it's a very specific They thing. will be wearing coats in LA if it's under yes. 60 degrees, but it's very different. <laughs> I don't even know. I feel like California is such a sweatshirt kind of a place. No, <laughs> y- y'all wear coats when it's below 65. It's it's real, but they're anyway. not like pea coats. I guess yeah. Like I, no, I really envision I envision New York as like the pea coat city and like Chicago. To your point, like up north. Oh, I wasn't like even thinking pea coat. I was thinking like Canada goose trench coat. Yeah, like oh, full like, on. Anyway. I'm thinking stylish yeah. coats. Was like, okay, my Canada goose style. is very stylish. Thank you very much. <laughs> anyway, anyways, I just I think that first stanza opens up in a really kind of magical way. To you guys' earlier point, it's very romantic. It's it's using words like a glow kaleidoscope heartbeats 
And so there I just, it's, she has this tendency to really romanticize things and to make that ordinary extraordinary. And I feel like you start off with that in this song. Speaking of romance, I would love to jump to the bridge if you'll let me. I know it's a little, yes. it might be. <gasps> Do it. Do I it? wanted to bring that up too. So okay. no, you were same page. <laughs> I'm going to read the bridge. Like any great love, it keeps you guessing. Like any real love, it's ever changing. Like any true love, it drives you crazy. But you know you wouldn't change anything, anything, anything. What a poem. What an ode to New York. And yeah, this is an analogy comparing New York City to a love, to being in love. And this is – it wasn't until – focusing on this song here for this purposes and I was like oh she's equating New York City to to love like that's the whole song which I love NY has been a campaign yes for, for a very long time decades since the, 60s uh, the, or 70s. the I heart New York like the I heart, I heart yeah like the I heart New York logo which recently did get upgraded yeah we won't um, talk about it it was bad anyways Interesting that Taylor jumps into this talking about love because it is kind of, you can't really talk about New York without talking about the fact that they have this just like reputation for I love New York or I heart New York. That's like such a big part of their own brand. I think there's a difference though in I heart New York, which is loving New York, but then comparing New York City to, to a love because, and this bridge she's talking about it keeps you guessing. It's changing. It drives you crazy. Like it's a different – like when I think about the I, Lo- I Heart New York campaign, it doesn't necessarily acknowledge the sh- the crazy <laughs> – the things that drive you crazy. It is about – like to me it's about like idealizing and loving the great things about New York. But here in this bridge, she's directly talking about the things that are hard. It keeps you guessing, it's ever-changing, and it drives you crazy, but you wouldn't change anything. One note that I also made was that I do think that there's two different kinds of people, or like two different kinds of relationships that people have with New York. There's the outside perspective of people who like maybe aspire to go there, but they're not from there, and it's like their their, uh, perspective of New York. And then there's like the locals who have been there maybe for generations and have lived there still immigrated there at some point, but then stayed. And I think when you like talk about the I love New York or I heart New York campaign also, like I do think that for someone who's outside it, sometimes it can seem like the ultimate, I'm going to go to New York. It's going to be amazing. You kind of do like put all these things that are kind of in the song on a pedestal or you like put it at a level if you've never been there of like almost goals. If if we make it there, then then that's something to be. It's another good good New York song. If I can make it there, I'll make it anywhere. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) right. But but I could understand why to locals there, it's like you don't really think about it in in that great love the same way maybe if if this is like your home and it's always been your home. I think of it – so I grew up outside the city but have been 30 minutes outside the city so I consider – and then I've lived here for a while – also, they say that you can't call yourself a New Yorker until you lived here for 10 years. Take it or leave it. It doesn't matter. I think that what's interesting about living and loving New York is you both I, – I do still – I am still in awe of it. Like I do wake up and I and I – there are things that I am in awe of. And there are things where I'm like, oh, my God, if I see one more rat, I'm going to die. Okay, we'll bleep that out. <laughs> just there's just it's this dichotomy it's this place of of two sides that you can love and hate at the same time and so I actually think that to be in love with New York it, it's relating it to just a, a relationship you've been in for a really 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 long time or whether that be a romantic relationship or a family relationship where you can have deep love and admiration and also like are you kidding me that is you are driving me absolutely insane and I can't believe I put up with you that is what it is to I think be a New Yorker and the people who don't like New York are the people who don't want those extremes they just want their really cheap housing and no rats and no cockroaches and I'm like sure great but you also can't get the best pizza in the world at any time or go to Broadway on you know like that yeah I 
this this will probably be a broader statement about cities from from me. I de- I love New York. I, I but I also just in general like I'm just a city person. Cities do this thing where, and I think the song captures it well. The energy is either invigorating or it's overwhelming. Yes, and sometimes it can oscillate for the same person yeah. from second to second. And I think that's something that's so fascinating. And the song captures that, the idea of heartbeats under coats, a kaleidoscope, like all of that, the lights are so bright, but they, they never, never blind, blind me. me. It's so energizing. And then, but it can drive you crazy. It can keep you guessing. You can have moments where you're really overwhelmed by it. But it is like, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. But I think that there's something about just some people, and I count myself among them, that the... And, it is so invigorating to be around so many people doing so many things and just so much life that even though sometimes it can be a lot, it's, I feel more alive when I'm in the middle of a city than I do anywhere else. And that's not true for everyone, which is like, fine. We as a society can't all live in cities. So that's probably good. It's like the city (laughs) mouse and the country mouse (laughs) anecdote. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But this song captures that so well. The other caveat for this episode is that all three of us live in cities and Jen your husband's an urban planner yes so we're very pro city yeah I know (laughs) we're also all millennials who are a more city oriented generation actually than previous generations but yeah just the energy of a city there's nothing yeah I I think like I just brought up like the two kind of perspectives on New York because I did read some articles when even doing this research that this is this was when Taylor was moving there in the beginning. She has now had a residence there for quite some time. But there were such cynical articles at the time being like the New York that Taylor is thinking about is not the New York we know like from from local people. And it was like she will not remain. She will not continue to think this. Her opinions will change. And I think there's always haters of course. Haters but I do think it's I do think it's interesting that maybe there's some truth to it. Maybe she still feels this way to this day. I think there are people who do feel this way forever with New York. But at the same time, I think what we can definitely agree on and assume is that this feeling was very much that perspective of like an outsider coming in when when she wrote this song, just given um, your first time moving the, there. The, yeah. Yeah. And and I think especially as an artist that line of like searching for a sound we hadn't heard before. I think when you think of like, why do artists move to these artist meccas or hubs? It's like, they're always searching for something. You're looking for a muse or inspiration or whatever. Like, I mean, it could be New York. It could be also in a remote place wherever you go, but like sometimes artists go places for a reason. So uh, I think that the song just does a really good job capturing that energy. I also think, too, there's something about big cities where you can disappear better in a big city Mm -hmm. than you can in other places. And I think I saw an interview with Taylor at some point recently where she was or some famous person talking about how New York was great because even though the paparazzi are always there, they're like doing long lenses from across the street because they can't just like all come into the coffee shop with you (laughs) and it's just it's a place where like you have no privacy really but also people don't care as much and there's something about just kind of disappearing in a big city that can be really soothing sometimes um even for like being not a famous person being in a crowd that no one knows me sometimes is like one of the most freeing feelings yeah The one last thing I want to say is like, okay, so again, people, when this song came out, there were a lot of haters. I think Taylor got made like the official ambassador of New York. Oh, yeah. She, um, this song was anytime you'd get into a cab in like 2014, 2015, they'd play this song (laughs) and they had her videos. Like, I think she filmed something that was probably the same time she filmed the promos for this album when she was on the Empire State Building. Yeah. So it was, this was quite the song in New York, whether you liked it or not. She came under fire a little bit for... I guess, commercializing this city or whatever, when there's so many, there's so much poverty in the city as well. Or like, I I think the thing that the thing that kept coming up is like, yes, it's this glorified city, but um, there's also a lot of issues and, and whatever. Okay. And well, yeah. Did they do that for Frank Sinatra? Like, hello, she was not the first person to write well, a song about I think New York. what's really interesting <laughs> is I came across an article. I don't know if this is true, but it was in a, I think it was in the Times. So I assume that it, it was at some point. But she said, she basically just said that she was going to donate all proceeds from this song to the public school system of New York, which oh. is really kind of awesome. Um, and it has nothing to do with our lyric analysis, but I 
If that's true, that's lovely. Yeah, I just wanted to like throw it out there that that's pretty cool. If any if anyone looks at any sort of art about any metropolitan area and is like, well, it doesn't capture every part of it. Yeah, that's the point of these massive Hello. cities. It is physically <laughs> impossible to capture every element of the city. If you think one song about this is going to capture everything, it's not. And also, of course, it's a big city. It has problems. That's what happens when people exist together. <laughs> I was just going to say, like, so many of the problems are also rooted in that history of emigration and this idea that it was it's an entry point. You have, to this day, a diversity of people who come and try to make it there because to the other song, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. But <laughs> if, if you have a place where people are coming, leaving their lives behind and starting over like of course you're gonna have poverty of course you're gonna have cultures clashing suburbs we have, like, have poverty too it's true but like <laughs> big cities are hubs and they will attract more people well and there's yeah there's a larger population so you're but yeah. you know anyway yes yeah this is where I wish Chris was home because I could just call out in the other room and ask him what What's the, the ratio of poverty was. And he would probably <laughs> find it in like two seconds. But he is unfortunately out of town this weekend, which is unfortunate. Oh, I love that but, we chose today to do this song, to this topic. I know. He he would probably know so much more about this. The only other thing I will say about this song is I am probably going to New York City later this year. And the other two songs it, we are chosen, I got to you. listen to it. I'm so here. I got to listen to them as I entered that city, and I've never gotten to listen to Welcome to New York oh. while entering New York City, and I will be doing it. So I will have the trifecta um, um, by the end of this year, and I'm very excited. I do it every it. time. Every time I land in New York, that's what's Boston. So you're saying <laughs> that I should wake up every morning to Welcome to New York? <laughs> yes, that should be your alarm. You should leave and come back, and then every come time back I to come back song. from New Jersey, I should be playing that song. <laughs> By now, we know you've already heard about Libro FM because we have told you about it. But did you know that not only can you get two audiobooks for the price of one with your first month of membership as an AP Taylor Swift listener, but you also can get 30% off a specific book that is any of the books on our playlist. So uh, go to our playlist, the Libro FM playlist, in our show notes where we list all of the books that we talk about on the podcast and every episode. And if you want to purchase any of those specific books, uh, you can use the discount code APTS30, APTS30, for 30% off any of those specific books. So a membership is fantastic. We highly recommend it. Then you can just get all the books you're interested in. But if you're really interested in something that we're talking about and you want just that one book, don't worry. We got you covered there as well. APTS30. Uh, go to the book list through our specific link in our show notes, and then you will be able to redeem that discount. I That's a good transition to the next song, because I have a song that I, too, play whenever I'm in this city, even though it is not my favorite. I have London Boy. This is from Lover, 2019, track 11, written by Taylor Swift, Jack Antonoff, and Mark Anthony Spears. There, this song also interpolates the song Cold War, so Cautious Clay gets a writing credit on this song as well. I love London, so I live in New York, but my favorite place in the world is is London. And this song, Same. right? Hands it, down. It just it is it is. I'm an Anglophile. I love I, every time I land in London, I feel like I am home, and I can't explain it other than I just love being there. So when this song came out, it didn't matter to me that it wasn't a great song because it is an anthem. And as I got the opportunity... I, I, I love how you keep saying that it wasn't a great song as if that's an accepted fact. I, I think don't it's a love great the song. song. <laughs> I don't love the song. Oh, I love this song. I don't love the song. I know. Um, I know. You just and, kept saying it like it's a fact. And I'm like, it's, it's Well, actually, no. It, it, well, it was, it was actually widely panned. Like, they, in my research for this episode, yeah, the two songs... People are like, this is the second worst song on Lover behind wow, me really? yes yeah people do not love this song I love it for okay. its representation of London but actually I will talk about how it is a very interesting representation of London so this song is London boy which uh, we should do a grammar episode but London is describing the boy so you would think this would be a song about the boy from London but instead it is a song <laughs> mostly about London and she starts – well, no, it really starts I off. I mean – Okay, yeah, sure. You want to fight me? Let's do this. <laughs> well, you have lyrics. He likes my American smile. That's about her. 
<laughs> it's not about the boy. <laughs> it's about it's about him. Like he likes the American smile. And it's about things she does with him. She meets his friends. They go do these things together. I have this color coded. So, and my green color coding <laughs> is very few that are things are about the boy. He has dimples and an accent. He says, Darling, I fancy you. Well, I think it's hard to separate because he's by the title, like he's the London boy. So he's already being like labeled as he's putting being put in a bucket. Sorry, sorry, Jody. We're not even in the lyrics and we're already fighting and I feel <laughs> alive. No, I'm thrilled. This is the best. This is exactly what she wanted. I want this to never end. <laughs> he just can't be separated from the city. They are one and the same. All right, I, I haven't even started the first. It's not even a verse. It's the intro <laughs> and it's Idris Elba and James Corden. Want to go driving on my scooter around London. Weird. I don't know. I don't know what to do with it. I'm just going to not touch it for now. So the, the first verse is characteriz- characterizations and stereotypes of America. Motown, SoCal, Springsteen, faded blue jeans, Tennessee whiskey, and then, but something happened. I heard him laughing. I saw the dimples first, and then I heard the accent. So that is what kind of transitioned us into London or about the London boy. But again, it, it's not about the boy. They say home is where the heart is, but that's not where mine lives. So it's a song about London, not about the London boy. This song has me questioning whether only British people have dimples and why, if that's the case, Americans <laughs> don't have dimples. No, Americans absolutely have dimples. <laughs> I have one dimple. I have half a dimple. I have one dimple too. My brother has two very big dimples. Anyway. I don't, but... Yeah. But I think what she's saying is that is what she noticed about this boy. Like, what are the defining characteristics of this person? It's dimples and accent and that he's from London. And then we go into all of these things about London. So anyway, we started with the characterization and stereotypes of America. And that makes me question or wonder, like, are the London references also stereotypes? And my answer is yes and no. So the first thing I want to talk about, and this is not a deep dive, so we're not going to go line by line, but I want to list for you the places in London that she references. And I will also link for our listeners a Google Maps where I have flagged all of these places so you can see them for yourself. And I have included the lyrics as well. You're welcome. Yes. Can you also add the location of Jeremy Bentham's body? Yes, I absolutely Um. am happy to add. That's That's at University College London. (laughs) (laughs) The Warren Street uh, by, oh God. (laughs) I used to live there. I went there. Anyway. Go back and listen to our... Right where you left me episode. I'll make more sense. I haven't even gotten to the first actual place in London, guys. It's going to be a long episode. It's Camden Market. Very touristy. Kind of grungy. Very touristy. Then we get Highgate, which is very local. Like, Highgate is not a place where tourists go. It is an old, money, wealthy neighborhood. Then we have the West End, which is like the theatrical theater, the theater district. Brixton, which is also very local. Shoreditch, young, hip. I call it, it's like the East Village. It's, it used to be very local. Now it's getting a little bit more touristy. We have Highgate again. Hackney, also very local. Louis V up on Bond Street. Bond Street is a touristy, but also just like expensive. It's like going to Madison Avenue. So I, yes, I called it touristy, but I was also just like on Madison Avenue today. So locals go there, but very wealthy. It's like where all the upscale brands are. Yeah, that's where Louis V up on Bond Street. The Heath, like a Tennessee skeleton, Stella McCartney on the Heath. The Heath is Hampstead Heath, which is also a very like kind of a local place, a beautiful park, another very wealthy neighborhood. Then you have Soho, which is like kind of at the center near the West End, touristy, commercial. And then she repeats a couple other ones. So I counted Shoreditch as both touristy and local. And if we do go with that math, Five of the places she's referencing are very, like, places that locals go, and four are touristy. So what does that mean? I don't know, but that was part of my analysis of this song. I think I think this is one of the hard things about cities, too, with touristy and non-touristy, because it's they like... Blend. They're, like, all the same. They blend, yeah. Like, if I had to classify San Francisco I mean it is easy to it's easy to pinpoint the local kind of spots like sometimes they're residential quiet yeah their neighborhoods of yeah tourists are not gonna go unless you know somebody who lives there but then there's neighborhoods that are like definitely touristy and yet all the locals also go there um because they're just nice parts of the city and 
Yeah. That's where people hang out. I was in Madison Avenue. I was I was there today. Or like, you know, Times Square. I, I, I don't go and hang out in Times Square, but I go to see Broadway shows. I have to go through Times Square or my office is there, right? Like, so yeah. So again, that's but what I think what I'm trying to do with that is talk a little bit more about the picture that yeah. she's painting of London here, which is this mix of very local residential places that you would only know if you either live there or know someone who lives there, and then places that are much more common to go to. It's for like anybody. city name dropping. I think all of these places, touristy or not, I don't think somebody who hasn't been to London would get it, right? They're, it's it's name dropping, like local destinations. Yeah. I mean, you may have heard of like Camden Market or the West End, but not really known what, no, you wouldn't know what that means, right? You, you yeah. even if you've yeah. heard what this is, you will not necessarily know what this means. And what this city, local neighborhood name dropping reminded me of is one of my favorite books, Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf, another book where there is just this constant name dropping and the whole book takes place throughout the city of London, three different characters on their walking journeys through London. It's a great example of a book where the city is its own character. It's its own character, also, exactly. Actually. And and the place and the city brings the story to life and adds this other layer into it. And I also will link the, I found a great Mrs. Dalloway Google map that I will also link in our show notes so that you can just have all of the maps. And when you go to London, you can decide, do you want the Taylor Swift map of London or do you want the Mrs. Dalloway map of London? And they don't really intersect. Actually, the or only- you want the Jeremy Bentham map of London. Very different. That's not Jody's map of London, which I also have. The only place where <laughs> London boy and Mrs. Dalloway overlap is on Bond Street. You're welcome. That is actually very interesting. <laughs> I did all the extra credit. <laughs> and got graded on a curve. This song to me, I really like this song, which is funny to me that people don't. I like it because to me, it feels like if I were to just to make a list of places that Chris and I've been that were really important to us, and then I just put it to like bouncy music, that's what it feels like to me of this almost like diary entry, this highlight reel of, hey, like, babe, look at all of these places we've been to together. And I think I I see your point, but it, to me, the idea of the song is like, it's not, it, she doesn't talk about the boy that much, but the point is, is that London and this boy are one. Mm. She cannot go to Highgate without thinking about this London boy. She cannot go to Soho without thinking that this, this city, this massive city of London has now become intertwined with this London boy and the idea of my home is where the heart is that that's not where mine lives it lives with the London boy in London Mm -hmm. which this is really funny to be saying when we don't know what so long no it's killing me (laughs) this will be so fun to revisit (laughs) Uh. but also I I I mean truly it is also all over London I think like part of the part of the rationale for name dropping all these is like it's like all over it's like every part of it the death by a thousand cuts lyric of uh trying to find a part of me that you didn't touch that kind of comes to mind because trying to find a part of the city that you didn't touch or like when you talk about cities as characters characters but it's the same kind of idea of we touched every little part of it or there's memories in every part of it and like let me just name a few it I I literally keep comparing to just San Francisco because cities have these little neighborhoods and it's like well if I just list off every neighborhood like it's like and then that's the city it's like you just go down the map and you're like let me just name but they also have personalities in each of these neighborhoods are so different and so yeah she's Again, my other note was, was this sponsored by the London Tourism Board? Because it is such an advertisement. Being ambassador of New York is not enough. Like, must also be (laughs) ambassador. It's not enough. Now she needs London, too. Well, I also loved there. She also has, like, specific characterizations of the city that are not the locations. Like, now I love high tea stories from uni. Uh, You can find me in the pub. We're watching rugby. Show me a gray sky, a rainy cab ride. Babe, don't threaten me with a good time. Like, love it. Love it. Not going to lie. Darling, yeah. I fancy you. Like, the main. Not going to lie at all. When I go to London, this song is the backdrop for – it is my Instagram caption. It is on every Instagram story. It is chef's kiss for that. I mean, 
I think what you're saying about being an Anglophile is so well woven in it the is, song. Yeah. Like the kind of not only the the names of places, mm-hmm. but the very language she's using is it's you're like having these little references to British English. The places, the experiences. Yeah, it is this Anglophile moment, but it's also it's which I know some people disagree with this, but to me, the song is kind of a hybrid where you were talking about tourist and local, but it's someone who's loved the city from the outside, but to someone who the city is also becoming home. And mm. I think that's what's that's really interesting about it, too, is this this is a celebration of London, but it's a celebration of the journey of this is cool. I'm going to go to this West End, but also I'm going to go meet this person's best mates and we're gonna high tea is kind of it's fun it's a real thing but it can also be really touristy but then a rainy cab ride I mean you're gonna experience it but to celebrate it is a much more of a like I've embraced this home this is something that's a part of what it is it feels like it's that like kind of hybrid journey between a tourist who is feeling at home in a new place now yeah, I think it's also interesting that she says, but God, I love the English at that point. Maybe that's to like Jody's earlier point of like, it's not just it's not the boy, just boy, it's like also just the English culture as a whole. The other line that's not so much about the city, but it is about the English culture, stick with me, I'm your queen. Now it is lowercase q queen, but still that's a very loaded phrase to say to a London boy, like, hey, I'll be your queen, Tennessee Stella McCartney, like there there I mean at this time this was written there was a queen so you're basically saying give me your loyalty now I'm your queen which I just thought was very interesting and then she shouts out her friend Stella McCartney it is interesting too after we did king of my heart and talked about kingdom inside my room and the royalty references Mm -hmm. because reputation was right before this so the way that that's continuing to develop is really interesting I love London, so I'll... Uh, one th- I mean, I think one thing that's really interesting is that this is a portrait of London that I think we don't get a lot, maybe, in in literature, certainly. Like, I think in, in movies, you get it a lot. I feel like London is a rom-com capital sometimes, and you get these versions of this lighthearted London romance. No, but the the version of London in, in um, Jodie's showing Dalloway. me her I'm like, excuse Dalloway me. book... <laughs> No, like the version of London that you get in Mrs. Dalloway is a world post World War or during post World, World War, War II, II era. Yeah, the war had just ended. Post immediately or World War One. World War One. Yeah, she died before World War Two in the middle of World War Two. Yeah, right. It's it's post World War One, a very different kind of London, and you do in literature get a much more serious version of London. Sometimes you get a lot of the poverty and like Industrial Revolution version of London, where there's awful yeah. conditions i mean it's just this like lighthearted, romantic mary poppins when i think of this, this is very mary poppins <laughs> is it? yeah <laughs> on the rooftops of london da, 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 da. yeah like i guess like when i think of romantic capitals of the world and maybe this is getting into a transition <laughs> i do not think of london I do. <laughs> as the romantic capital of the world But it is like certainly in like rom-coms and chick flicks, I think you do get the London kind of, I'm thinking of what a girl wants. I don't know. We've gotten this side of it before. I cried at that movie. You're kind of getting like those kind of vibes here. I just haven't heard it in a song like that. I don't know. I'm just going to say one thing before we move on. Harry Potter. But but Harry Potter. I have no specific thing but to talk about London and not say Harry Potter feels wrong. You mean so. the one that takes place in Scotland? <laughs> well, like you can go to King's Cross Station in London and go to Platform 9 and 3 quarters. and Yeah, that's true. Wait, wait, wait. Stop. Is Hogwarts in Scotland? Yes. Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> Since yeah. when? Since the beginning of time. And J.K. Rowling is also that? Scottish. Did you know that? Like, no. How, wait. <laughs> How do we know that Hogwarts is in Scotland? We all know this, Jody. No, I did not know this. (laughs) All right, let's go to the next song before I lose my (laughs) shit. (laughs) But yes, um, actually, point well received about King's Cross and stuff. Yeah. I I was sad that Taylor didn't mention King's Cross because I do think it's uh, an important pilgrimage point. Diagon Alley is meant to be one of the markets in London. It's literally, Mm -hmm. yeah. Like Harry Potter's. Harry Potter... Regardless of where Hogwarts is, is a London movie. 
Well, my main point for bringing it up was there is a very fun <laughs> touristy thing to do for Harry Potter in London. And... I think your main point for bringing it up was you knew that this would somehow start a fight. I did not. I did not know we would end up here. I thought we would all just be like Harry Potter and move on. Instead, Jody's entire reality is crumbling in front of her right now. I think ever since I, I don't want this show to become political, but I'm like, ever since I went to Scotland, I have a real appreciation for the sensitivity yes. between Scottish people no. not getting their due. So no, no, no. I definitely don't want to. A hundred percent agree with that. I was just thinking <laughs> tourist things in London. <laughs> Eras tour back in action, it is time to be bejeweled once again. If you're looking for rhinestones so you can DIY your Eras tour outfit, look no further than crowned crystals. I rhinestoned my lover glasses, some t shirts, and a clear purse, all with crowned crystals rhinestones. It was beautiful, and I got so many compliments. And we've partnered with Crown Crystals so that listeners can get 10% off of their order with code APTS. Head to crownedcrystals.com with two Ks, crowned with a K and crystals with a K, and use code APTS, and you too can make the whole place shimmer. Well, I have the final song, and I will say this is going to also be our deep dive. So I'm going to talk very little about the lyrics because there's a lot this in the lyrics. This is our last song. So I won't talk about the song, but I'll talk about what it's about. Well, yes. So there's like so much in the lyrics that isn't about the city, but the city is still very important to the lyrics. So it's just, we're doing Paris. Sorry. I felt like that was assumed and I should not have. Which is my favorite city since you both said London. Oh, great, because I'm about to crap so. on Paris, so have, we'll have fun for it's this. It's fine, I can take it. <laughs> I can rebuttal. It's fine. <laughs> she's in fighting mode. She just fought me, so she's ready. I was her warm-up. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so Paris was written by Taylor Swift and Jack Antonoff. It came out in 2022 on the album Midnight's and is track number 16. This was the 3 a.m. edition, right? This was not on the... Yeah. I pulled up the Till Dawn edition, but yes, I think it's also the... Th There's so many editions. I, uh, yeah. It wasn't like the core. Yeah. Right. Taylor, yes. you're killing us. But we love you. Keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. that's great. So this song, we'll get into... There's so much in this lyrics, but essentially the song is Paris as a metaphor. So she says things like I was taken in by the view like we were in Paris like we were somewhere else like we were in Paris so the song itself it's interesting to me in this we can talk about this more in the deep dive that the song is on the same album as Lavender Haze because it has a very similar kind of message of everything else doesn't matter when you're in love the only other very well Cheap wine, make believe it's champagne. Champagne is obviously a French thing, as is wine as a whole, but like champagne itself <laughs> is French. <laughs> um, the champagne region. Yes, exactly. <laughs> in France. But wine as well. I went to a winery in France last summer and we were asking the guy giving us a tour how he got into how he got into this business. And he was like, Oh, like I did major in basically business specializing in wine, but also I just drink a lot. And I was like, You are the most French person I've ever met in my life. That's incredible. <laughs> And then talking about like pretend alleyways, you get this in any big city, you're going to have more alleyways. So there's, there's just definitely city but imagery there. Paris has a lot of alleyways, I will say. And also stumble down pretend alleyways. I always yeah. thought I assumed cobblestones, right? When you're stumbling over. Yeah. Yeah. There is, I think there's something about the way that Paris is built too, where it's like, I mean, a lot of cities, a lot of old cities have this where they're like on different levels over time. Because wasn't that to protect from being invaded? Yeah. And I think also just like the way that the city is built over yeah. time. Like they'll do construction in different phases and just keep building right on top. The only other uh, lyrical thing very specific to Paris is let the only flashing lights be the tower at midnight. So the tower, the Eiffel Tower, really almost said that in French and my brain immediately just broke. <laughs> Do you yeah. speak French? <laughs> My brain was like, Tower Eiffel. No, wait. Eiffel Tower. I do. <laughs> I do um, not. I, I minored in French. Did you really? Um, so, yeah, I did. I would say I'm a high-functioning tourist. <laughs> I didn't minor in it, but 
I majored in it at this summer camp that I went to for six weeks, and I did. <laughs> this it in episode college. is unhinged. You majored in <laughs> French in camp. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I can go on about this camp. It's a nerd camp, six weeks, all paid for by the state of Georgia. Oh, and, that sounds uh, amazing. I majored in French. I went to sewing camp in middle school. Sometimes our friendship as a group makes a lot of sense the more we unlock our backstories. <laughs> I went to business camp. So, yeah, this all fits. <laughs> Anyway, Paris, <laughs> like we were in Paris. Yeah, so I am also a huge Francophile. So did you either of you ever read the Royal Diaries series when you were younger? No. I was. Yes, obsessed. actually. Obsessed. And so I read one. So it's, yeah. they're really good. They're great, actually. Obviously, some of it skims over a little bit of the truth because it's for kids. So I've learned more since I grew up, but I read the Elizabeth the first. A great feminist book. Great feminist books. And it's very much, it's female royals. And so you're getting their stories. And I remember distinctly reading the Elizabeth the first one and the Marie Antoinette one. And I was pretty much a goner from that point. Also really into Austrian history too, because of the Marie Antoinette yeah. coming from the Habsburg. Anyways, definitely Francophile. I mean, I minored in French literally for fun. It wasn't really necessary for what I was planning on doing with my life. You're using it for this podcast. I am. <laughs> so I think it is necessary. And I got to spend six weeks in the city of Arles in southern France, which is where if, you, if you've seen a Vincent van Gogh painting of any countryside, it's basically that area. He lived in Arles. That's just, so Provence is where I've spent most of my time. Paris, though, as a metaphor in the song. So Paris is a metaphor for being in love, for being hiding away from the world, for being untouched basically by reality, because it's like you're in Paris. It's like you're somewhere else and no one can really bother you. It's really interesting to me for a lot of reasons. I will get into the history of the city, but the first thing I wanted to bring up is, have you guys heard of the Paris syndrome? Nope. Mm -mm. So this is a real thing that was coined in the 80s. If you Google this, a lot of people have opinions about this, but it is a real thing, particularly from Japanese tourists, where Paris is so romanticized that the realities of Paris basically create an extreme culture shock that creates like panic attack syndromes. And about 20 Japanese tourists a year suffer from this, which is a very small percentage. But it's like a real physical thing that the reality of Paris is such a letdown. I love that it's Japanese tourists specifically. Wait, it could almost make a visitor faint with disappointment. Yep. That's like a Jewish mother syndrome. <laughs> I'm surprised that New York doesn't have a syndrome that's similar. Yeah, as soon as a rat <laughs> crawls over your foot, you're going to be like, I'd faint from fear. But when you think about New York... You you see representations of all sides of it. When you think about Paris, it's usually portrayed in a super romanticized way. Mm. And it seems like apparently in Japanese culture, it is very, very much that narrative from what I could tell. Obviously, I have not personally experienced it. But I'm also curious as to... Maybe you're going to go into this, but I'm also interested in like what parts of Paris are so drastically different. Because like having gone there a few times, like I actually feel like it tracks pretty well so the thing to me I prefer London over Paris but I prefer France over the UK which is a really interesting way to feel Paris is dirty it just is the metro system is really old and clunky and crowded I'm like I don't I don't maybe it's like I've lived in American cities too long but I'm like I don't feel like it's dirty <laughs> like, I'm like I think it's pretty clean <laughs> <laughs> Paris was like kind of no offense New York can be really dirty too Paris and New York always felt a little more on par with me to each other yeah. but that the way they're portrayed is not that way maybe okay so maybe also I've heard I've heard Tokyo is very clean so I wonder if it's also like the contrast from like going but that's why I was like I, I'm surprised that like people don't feel that way about New York also because I do think that New York is also very filthy. <laughs> the main point here is that Paris syndrome is a real thing. Whether or not you experience it, other people, even if you're not to that same intensity, it is a city where a lot of people do feel some sense of letdown. Not everyone, of course. But to me, that, that alone was really interesting to use this as a metaphor of like, oh, it's like we're in Paris. And it's like, sure, there are parts of Paris that are 
that are beautiful, but Paris is still a city where a ton of people live together. I've seen really gross things when I'm in Paris where I'm like, why is that there? Please, gross. Or like the metro's really old and it's super crowded and people are smelly. It's it's still a real place where real people live. So the main point with the letdown is just it's an interesting metaphor that it's it's a place that is known for being a beautiful place of love, but there's the the there's still humans who live there who are <laughs> Pe- yeah. gross people because that's just the way the world works so it, it's it's the idea of using Paris as a metaphor to me is really fascinating because it's a metaphor that will inevitably let you down because it simply mm. can never live up to the Hollywood version of it because that's just not life and I just thought that was a really interesting metaphor to use yeah because I think where you're getting with that is this the song is about presumably the early stages of being so head over like she's I'm so in love that I might stop breathing right you're so yeah. In that lavender haze stage. And then very often in once you get past that stage, it is a disappointment. I do think like in that sense, the fact that it's so early and the fact that they're not actually in Paris mm-hmm. is like kind of the yeah. irony of the whole thing. It's you're ro- you're really exactly. romanticizing it and you're like cognizant of the fact that you're romanticizing it. Like you're romanticizing it to the extreme. You're like, what's the most romantic place in the world? Paris. Paris. Yeah. And like the idea of Paris. And we're not even there. We're going to pretend this cheap wine is fancy wine from France. Yeah. It's that question of always like, okay, but why that metaphor? And I just feel like the more you pull at the thread of Paris as this like beautiful, idealistic city full of love and romance, it, the more it kind it of unravels. <laughs> yeah. And it's, but it's also like, it's not that there's none there. Right. I have enjoyed parts of Paris. I would, if I, if, if you were going to pick a place in France to go, Lyon is my personal favorite city in France. It's the Michelin star restaurant capital of the world. We will have a sub stack full of Jen's France ref- yes. r- referrals. Yeah. <laughs> they kept, they have their Roman architecture all the way to modern. So you see the whole story anyways, but it's just like that, that thread kind of unravels. And I think that there's something there to being like, yes, the idealistic part's not there, but the reality can still be beautiful. But you just have to say, I'm okay with some trash on the side of the street. I'm okay with navigating a very stressful language barrier to order food that I hope is what I want it to be. To me, it still works well as a metaphor of the difference of I'm in this heady love and then the day-to-day realities of a relationship that it's, it's not still beautiful, but it's more complex and nuanced and not as idealistic as it might have seemed when you were first imagining it. Mm. There's one last thing that we didn't actually touch on that was kind of maybe related to the reputation of the city is like also uh, Paris time seems to slow down. It has maybe that's something that also lends itself to the romantic nature. You have this idea of you can just sit at a cafe, sipping your coffee, for staring at hours. people for hours and get lost in it yeah like nobody's gonna rush you like we compare to like welcome to new york or london like both like really hustle bustle kind of cities yes paris also has a big population but it's definitely a different attitude a different attitude and a different perspective on life where you can just like really slow down and soak in which is really odd for a city too so i also think that that is like part of the kind of like charm that people sometimes maybe envision yeah, the French know their rights and they're not willing to compromise. And that's a wonderful <laughs> thing about the French. Yeah. Okay, all right. But to learn more about the song Paris, I guess you're going to have to tune in next week when we deep dive it because I think we got through two lines. The rest of this was just... Yeah, but now we've done the massive metaphor and now we can go through all of the other things. <laughs> right, this was the pre-work. Exactly. This was our pre-work. <laughs> Join us next week as we deep dive Paris right here on AP Taylor Swift. That's all we have for you today on AP Taylor Swift. Be sure to rate and review us on your favorite podcast app. Follow us on your social channel of choice at AP Taylor Swift to stay up to date. And join us next time as we overanalyze and deep dive into the next Taylor Swift song on AP Taylor Swift.